So praise God. So we're here again for another edition of 153greatfish.com. Um, got an exciting Bible study tonight, at least I think so. Uh, might be a little bit uh, laborious for some of you, maybe too simple. But let's pray and ask the presence of Jesus to our study. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you, mighty God. We ask you, Lord, to be part of our Bible study. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that you would just send this to the person who needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let's go right to the PowerPoint. We're going to talk about a cold case file here. This cold case file has been dormant for, gee, since 325 A.D. And we're going to make the case of restoring and finding out who murdered this cold case. And here we begin. Who murdered the gospel is my question tonight. And we begin with this. Paul confronted the Judaizers in Antioch, Syria church and in the Galatia churches, plural. At stake was the law of the spirit, liberty versus the law of the flesh. This is ritual laws of the Jews. So the issues of the Judaizers was this. They wanted to repeal Paul's authority claiming that he had never seen Jesus. But Paul makes the case in the Galatian letter that in fact he had seen Jesus and that his gospel came from Jesus. And it wasn't for about 17 years that he went to Jerusalem and compared notes with Peter. He is saying, and we were preaching the same identical gospel. So Paul states his authority, but they wanted to repeal it that he was not an apostle of Christ. And these were the Judaizers, by the way. They wanted to institute circumcision, the caste root, dietary laws, and calendar festivals in the Gentile churches of Galatia. You can read about this in Acts 15, 1 through 35, Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 10, and 2, uh, the entire chapter. So Paul continuously warned the Ephesian church, not just the Galatian church, but the Ephesian church of grievous wolves. And, of course, that word grievous is weighty or deep matters. That these deep people, intellectuals, would enter the church and carry it away into apostasy. And this occurred, of course, in 134 A.D. when Justin Martyr, the Greek philosopher, he arrived at Ephesus to be baptized wearing the Greek philosopher's robe. You can read about this warning that Paul gave the leaders of this church in Acts 20, 27 through 31. Paul said he warned them with weeping tears. This was Paul's great revival church. And then, of course, we know that just 35 years later, maybe 25 years later, Jesus warned the Ephesian church that they had left their first love. I see I misspelled that word Ephesians there. So Justin created this doctrine, the subordinated word doctrine. This doctrine did not exist, and Justin had to use Stoic philosophy to create it, and we're going to learn some of that tonight. So Acts 15.1, certain men came down from Judea. They taught the believers, that is in Antioch, Syria, and said, except you're circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So it wasn't just the uh, Galatian church. It was also the Antioch church. These were the Judaizers. They wanted to keep the church Jewish. But, of course, the rituals of the Old Testament law had been fulfilled, and they were done away with. That covenant was gone. So uh, Galatians 2 says this, But when Peter came to Antioch, Paul said, I withstood him to his face. For before that, certain, came, certain people came from James. Peter did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, these Judaizers, he withdrew, separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, fearing the Jews. And then he goes on to say that even Barnabas was caught up in this. But Paul confronted him that Peter had added to the gospel, which God had given him to give to the Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? Peter was mixing with the Gentiles. Then he felt like he was being judged by the Judaizers. You know, there's a lot of people today that are trying to reestablish Judaism in, uh, from the Messianics that have entered into the church. They're throwing salt over their shoulders. They're having cedar suppers. They're learning Hebrew the language of God, which it is not, of course, they're doing all these things. They really need to read Acts 15 and Galatians 2, in fact, the whole book of Galatians, and 
seriously consider what they're doing. Acts 20, it says this, Take heed, Paul says, therefore unto yourselves, he's warning the uh, church at Ephesus, and to all the flock of which the Holy Ghost made you the supervisors. For I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves, that word is barris, weighty matters, intellectuals, will enter in among you, destroying the flock. Also of your own offspring shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch, he means pray, be on the lookout, and remember that for three years I ceased not to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. The Ephesian church, Paul was warning and it would fall. This is about 54 AD when he said this. Sure enough, Jesus warned this church, the John the Revelator, in Revelation and said, you've left your first love. So here we see these two churches that were having problems. The Judaizers first came to Antioch, okay? before they came to Galatia. Then Galatia was attacked by the philosophers. And of course, Antioch, Syria was the uh, Gentile church, the great Gentile church where Paul and Barnabas were called prophets and teachers. Then they began to evangelize as apostles and they made it up to Galatia and they started a few churches there. Paul got sick up there. But then the philosopher in 134 AD, Justin Martyr came into the church and he took the church down, and the church has never been the same since. Here you see the philosopher's robe. It's a wolf, and he's carrying a little lamb to the slaughter. And that's because they murdered the gospel. Can you say praise the Lord? Who murdered the gospel? Well, we just learned the Judaizers did. They wanted to reinstitute the ritual laws of Pharisaical Judaism. That means rules of the Pharisees. So they were interested in people keeping the Sabbath. Uh, that's for you people that are in the uh, Seventh-day Adventist church. Cast root, dietary laws. A lot of you are vegetarians because of cast root. Holy days. A lot of you are following the calendars and festivals of Israel. Circumcision. Kippahs covering your head. Veils on women. Sacrifices at the temple, which doesn't exist, and a temple tax. These were the ritual laws that the Pharisees the Judaizers wanted to put on top of the Gentile church. So the philosophers, and that word philosophy is Sophia, or Greek wisdom, also known as metaphysics. So the Greeks believed that a person needed to practice or to become erite. That means you have to become the ideal Greek man containing all the Greek virtues like philosophy, education, high moral character. Then, of course, this idea of paideia. This was Greek philosophical culture and education. The Greeks wanted to bring paideia, and they brought it into the church, and it's still there. And I'm going to show you the evidence of this. Justin Martyr was the first. He said this, Socrates and Heraclitus, the Greek philosophers, were Christians because he brought in a language to explain who Jesus was. He brought in the seminal word doctrine. He said that Jesus was one logos of many logoses that God utters, kind of like a parallel universe. So Jesus is just one small word of many. So the root of the subordinated logos theology creates the eternal son, and that is a post, uh, and then the begotten son. We know this as the two sons doctrine, an eternal son and a begotten son. This came in because of Justin Martyr. However, his theology was so wrong that they felt they had to correct it. Now, there's another man named Plotinus. Uh, he was a Neoplatonic philosopher, 270 AD, and he destroyed, not deliberately, but because of the Christians that knew his philosophy, they destroyed Jewish monotheism hermeneutic, or the understanding of the one God, and he created the language that Greek believers have used ever since to reconcile Christianity with Platonic philosophy. And this is the current Logos theology, which you will hear at most of the uh, uh, seminaries around the world. Uh, the seminaries in Paris by the Catholics, the seminaries by the Baptists in Dallas, Texas, the seminary of the uh, Methodists in Kentucky. These seminaries all teach how to use philosophy of Plotinus to explain the Logos, to reconcile Plato with Christianity. This logo theology then permeated Tertullian, Athanasius, and Augustine, 
on up to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, 1292 uh, or 72, sorry, AD. So this fact, Plotinus, he provided the language. Justin Martyr started to provide the philosophy, although it had to be corrected, that led to the doctrine of the eternal son, the Trinity. So he did this using the, or the Greeks did this by using these philosophies. Number one, the theory of forms. This comes from Plato, the allegory of the cave and the Republic. It states that an idea of our minds is simply a word, a form, a thought. And you can have many of them that manifest. And this phenomenon is a mere shadow mimicking the form. That is a momentary, a momentary portrayal of the form under different circumstances. So he's saying this theory says that Jesus was just a temporary form of God. Thus, Jesus is a temporary appearance of God. He's a visible shadow of God's reality. He's less than fully the Father. And in fact, when you talk to most people that believe in the Trinity, they actually believe that Jesus is less. It comes through in their language when they speak. They will use the word gods, <laughs> persons, plurality. This theory of forms came out of Greek philosophy, and it permeates these ivory towers, these seminaries. I guess I said cemeteries, didn't I? These seminaries today. The second one is the seminal word. This is the one that Justin uh, brought in from Stoicism. It states that a word is a subordinated entity with the same will as God, but it was breathed. In other words, it was one breath, one breath of many, one word of many, and it's only a portion of the full word. It's not the one true God. Thus, Jesus is just a word that was with God. He's not the full word as the Father is. In other words, he doesn't have all domain, just a subordinated word like an angel or an apostle. And of course, they knew that this language was wrong because it made uh, Jesus was not co-equal. They couldn't, they couldn't explain the Godhead with it, so they had to correct this. And of course, they corrected it at Nicaea. Uh, Athanasius and uh, the uh, current Greek philosophers that, that had come into the church corrected it. These became the bishops of the head of the church, who was the Roman Emperor Constantine. Then the third philosophy that came from the Greeks was the emanation from the monad. This is just strictly Neoplatonism. Plotinus taught that there is a supreme, totally transcendent one, an essence that contains no division, multiplicity or distinction. It's, be, it's beyond all categories of being and non-being. It's transcendent, can't be understood. This one, the monad, cannot be from any other existing thing, nor is it merely the sum of all things, which is pantheism. The one, the monad, is the source of all emanations and first emanated the nous, the divine mind, or the logos. So the logos is just one emanation, the divine mind. As an emanation, the nous, or Jesus, is not the one, the full God, but he's a subordinate word made flesh. And so you can see what happened when Greek philosophy came into the church. They murdered the gospel by making Jesus a subordinated deity, not fully God, a person, not the Father in flesh, not God manifest in flesh. And of course, because we cannot describe the Incarnation. They decided to create a man-made theory, and it came out of Greek philosophy, which is man-made. It's not spiritual language, although the Greeks claim it was esoteric language, able to describe the divine. They corrupted the church with it, and now you know who murdered the gospel. So here's the monad, all the clouds, issues a nous, one word, a subordinated word, the mind of God, the man Jesus Christ, who is an eternal son, and he's also a begotten son. That makes two sons, and they force people to believe this, that he's co-equal, co-eternal, but not fully God. This makes no sense. Three does not equal one in mathematics, nor is there three persons in the Godhead. There never, never says that. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And of course, the Greek philosopher said, aha, we see the theory of forms. We see the subordinated word. We see the nous of the monad. And none of these philosophies, this language can be used to describe the mystery of godliness, the secret. 
God was manifest in the flesh. Now, when the Bible says God was manifest in the flesh, it means Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all of God was manifest in flesh. If you believe in an eternal Son, which makes two sons, now you've got four, not a trinity, but a quaternity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and eternal Son. We're in trouble, aren't we, with this philosophy? So, Revelation, Jesus warns the church of Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you have left your first love, the gospel. Remember, therefore, from when and where you fell. Thank you very kindly, Justin Martyr. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of its place, except you repent. This church was going downhill 35 years after Paul warned them. 90 A.D. when the Revelation was written. And then, sure enough, 134 A.D., Justin Martyr came in and took the greatest revival church down and corrupted. He murdered the gospel. And then he had help. <laughs> Tertullian, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, they all helped Athanasius. The gospel was murdered. You can see here, we're trying to get back to the gospel, climb up this icy tower, this icy ivory tower. So what is the gospel? It's not enough just to say it was murder, but let's find out what it is. The gospel is described in scripture, in scripture two unique ways. First, the entrance to the kingdom, which is the gospel of salvation. And second, the government in the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven of Jesus Christ is a spiritual nation, not a physical one. His kingdom is not of this world. It's different. It has a different form of organization with a unique authority structure that is founded solely on one royal law, agape love from the Holy Spirit. You can learn more about authority in my video that's on this website. If the royal law is governing, two signs manifest as witnesses to the kingdom. First one is power and authority over diseases and devils. And the second is remission of sins. Those are the two major signs of the kingdom. So, Jesus talks about the gospel of the kingdom. He said, repent. That's the first entrance principle. To enter our righteousness, enter the kingdom, our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. To be great, we must teach the Sermon on the Mount principles, found in Matthew 5, 1 through 20. You can read that in Matthew 5. Provision is given to those who seek, enter, and are governed by the kingdom of the Spirit. And Jesus also said the tares and the wheats and wheat will co-reside. And then he said, mysteries is revealed to insiders, but to the outsiders, parables are given. It's offense, and you have got to absolutely obey and get rid of pride and be humble to receive the revelation of the great mystery of godliness. Jesus Christ is the only Father you're ever going to see. So, Peter's gospel, he was given the entrance keys by Jesus. And Simon Peter answered and said, You, Jesus, are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then Jesus said this, pay attention, and I say unto you, You are Peter, and upon this revelation, this rock, I will build my church, and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, which you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's a pretty powerful statement Jesus made. Look at the authority he gave to Peter, the keys to the kingdom. So the keys that bind heaven and earth, Peter uses them in Acts 2, verse 37. Peter says, now... The people, the Jews, were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and all the apostles, What should we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Three thousand souls were saved. Now, here's the gospel right here. This is the keys to the kingdom. Entrance right here, this scripture. Notice what it does not say. Who accepts the Lord as their personal Savior? Who accepts Christ? Who will declare that Jesus is Lord? It doesn't say any of that. Say the sinner's prayer. It says repent, which means to do a 180, both morally and lifestyle. Then it says to be baptized. Some of you, half of you, just Americans, just Africans? No, every one of you in this name, the name of Jesus Christ, 
which seven days before he said, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So we see that Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Why? Why get baptized in Jesus' name? For the forgiveness of sins. And then you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here's the kingdom, the royal law, the, the two signs that manifest if you're in the kingdom is power and authority over disease and devils. That's talking about healing and casting out devils with authority. You don't ask them if, they, if it wants to leave. You command it to leave. And then forgiveness of sins. And we see that this fulfills that in Acts 2.38. So what is the gospel? What must I do to be saved? Well, this is what Ananias told Paul. He says, arise and be baptized. Baptism washes away your sins. A lot of people say, you don't have to be baptized. It's a work. Well, yeah, it's not the work the way you define it. It's a work of faith as James defines it. We must do the works of faith. If you pray verbally, that's a work. You're moving your lips. If you go to church, that's a work. You're going to church. You're, you're doing something physical. If you get baptized in Jesus' name, you're doing something physical, which is a work of faith, not a work of the law. Baptism is never found in the Old Testament law. How can it be a work of the law? You've been lied to. You've been told the wrong definition. A work of the law is ritual. We're talking about circumcision, cast root, okay, dietary laws, feast days. That's not what we're talking about here. Works of faith. Repent. Be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus, wash away your sins because we need to be buried with Jesus in baptism. Romans 6, read 3 through 4. That's the gospel, folks. So, there's two questions for the Galatians. Ready? Paul says, this only what I learn of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law? That's the rituals. Or by the hearing of faith? Are you all so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, you're now made perfect by the flesh. Everybody loves this part. But hey, if you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, you haven't really done the hearing of faith. Galatians, he said, goes on to say, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He's talking about the works of faith here, the law of the Spirit. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. Remember we said that the royal law of love is what brings the two manifestations, okay? The governance in the kingdom and the, the governance or the uh, remission of sin. So power and remission of sins. He says, you were doing well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? Acts 2.38 must be obeyed. But the ritual laws of the Jews, it's closed. It's over with. That contract is closed. It's expired. Burn the mortgage. 1 Corinthians 15 says this. Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you received. You stand in it. You're saved by it. For I delivered unto you how that Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So we see that the gospel that Paul defines, the saving gospel, is death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, resurrection. That's the saving gospel. And then, of course, there's the gospel of the kingdom, living by the Sermon on the Mount, the principles, etc., the royal law. So the cold case file has been solved. It was killed. The gospel was killed through philosophy and Judaizing until now we have the truth. We see that the real gospel, death, burial, resurrection, is found through repentance. That's where we die. Water baptism, every one of you in the name of Jesus, that's where we're buried with him in baptism. And receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is resurrection, death, burial, resurrection. That's the gospel. And it's found in Acts 2.38. The murdered gospel, the cold case, has been solved. It's found in Acts 2.38. Can you say praise the Lord? Well, I'm stopping there. Now, I'm hoping that you will break free from man-made philosophy and traditions. If you read Colossians 2, verse 8, Paul warns the church of Colossae to beware that they would be robbed by philosophy, not after Christ, the rudiments of the world, outright lying. Who lied? Well, we identified those guys. And who's perpetuating those lies? 
We need a real gospel in Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you again here on another edition of 153greatfish.com.